Hello there. This is Pastors of the Roundtable, the discipleship podcast of Monroe Missionary Baptist Church, brought to you by Together in Christ, the teaching ministry of MMBC in Monroe, Michigan. We encourage thoughtful discussion about the Christian faith and connect you to the people and the ministries of MMBC. Today, we have a special guest with us. Um, We talk about connecting you to the ministries of MMBC. We want to connect you today with uh, our women's ministry, and we've got our women's ministry leader, Kara Schramm, uh, joining us today. Thank you, Kara, for coming on. Thank you, Spencer. And being willing to to do this at late notice. I sent Kara a text message at 7 o'clock this morning, and it's just a little after 10, um, and she was willing um, to come in, and so I really appreciate that. Um, so we want to talk about women in the Bible, women discipleship, female discipleship in the Bible, but also, um, so, but also see how we can apply that to our church today. How Kara is leading our women's ministry um, to do that, um, what that should look like on the ground here at MMBC um, as we seek to grow men and women into committed followers of of Jesus Christ to steal, steal uh, Parkside's um, motto as well from Parkside Church. So, um, women following Christ. Um, I've got here on the paper just a list of women in the Old Testament and the New Testament um, because women have played a really important role in the history of redemption. Um, It can be very easy to name the men, but there's also a lot of notable women that have um, played a key role that God has used to bring about the birth of the Messiah, but also to spread his message um, and to worship him and to encourage the community of faith, whether that's in the Old Testament or the New Testament. So we have key women. I've got here on the paper just trying to um, just help us think. We've got Eve, right? Um, She is the mother of all the faithful. So she is our spiritual mother. Um, that's she, we're, we're called the seed of the woman, uh, because Jesus is the capital S seed. We are the small S seeds of the woman as well. Um, Sarah, uh, Rebecca, we think about Hannah in the old Testament women who are exemplars of committed faithfulness, um, to following the Lord, to following God in the old Testament. So, um, Kara, any of those women in the old Testament or any other women that you think of as exemplars of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ as a woman. And then what did that look like for them in the old Testament? And just thinking about what does it mean to follow Christ, even in their context um, back then, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Um, I think that in that culture, it was difficult enough alone just to be a woman and to, to follow the Lord I would find it interesting to know for real, like how women were in that culture, how many of them uh, did the, the, followed the law and the things that they needed to, just because that's what everybody did. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, like kind of like today, you know, there are people who go to church, they show up in church, they do the, the spiritual thing because that's what their families have done. Mm-hmm. That's what looks good in society. I, I would be interested to know what it was like then. Yeah. Were they all genuine in their heart, or did they do that just because that was the culturally demanded thing? I think for the women that did chose, did choose to follow the Lord, um, the ones you listed, I think that they were different, mm-hmm. is my guess, from yeah. the rest of the women. Right. And that they chose to be intentional about their following. Mm. You might want to bring your microphone just a little bit closer to you. Yeah, there you go. No, it's good. Yeah, no, I think so. Um Probably just like today, there are people who do something, who followed um, the religion of Israel just because that's what you did. Right. Um, and then there were other women who were exemplars of faith <laughs> sometimes. Um, and, and this is one of the things that happens is we even see in an instance like Deborah, where the men have failed to lead the people of God. Right. And so God raises up a godly woman like her. Um uh, to help spur and remind God's people of God's faithfulness and of his promises and of his truth. Um, yeah, I think women also, what's interesting too, I think, is that through from the very foundations of the Old Testament, contrary to what other worldviews held, women right away were, were said to be created in the image of God. Mm-hmm. Um, women were 
were regarded as co-heirs in that sense uh, from the very beginning of creation as uniquely equal um, because other religions and other worldviews would have had much more denigrating views of women and their value as people. Um, But from the very beginning, women are upheld as co-image bearers, equal in spiritual value, um, and um, they're intelligent also. I think that's one of the things that's striking about many of the women of the Old Testament is they're not um, they're not just passive spectators. They're actually intelligent, um, co- committed to following the Lord within their own context as mothers, as sisters, as women um, uh, who worship the Lord. Um, we see Hannah, right? She's she's praying uh, mm-hmm. at the at the altar at the temple. She's seeking the Lord's face. We see Miriam leading the women in praise to God because of God's salvation. Um, we even see a woman like Bathsheba who um, is involved in a great scandal with David. But later on, we see he really trusts her a lot. And she's actually a wise woman. And I think that when Solomon is describing the, wise, the godly woman in Psalm uh, or Proverbs 31, and also when he talks about listening to your mother's advice, he's thinking about Bathsheba. Um, so we've got women like that. Um, some, some women who are converted like Rahab or Ruth, Tamar, right? right? Women like that who have more scandalous pasts, um, but still God uses and forgives and brings in his grace. I think that's just a wonderful encouragement to see the wonderful diversity of the different women in different circumstances that God, that God has used. Yeah. That's interesting. You say that because just the last couple of days I've been reading about the <clears throat> four women listed in Matthew 1. Mm, yeah. And one of those is Rahab. And it, it's interesting to me how God always chooses to use just ordinary people mm-hmm. that become great. You know, we look to them as like stalwarts of the faith. But they're just ordinary people. Rahab um, wasn't even a follower of the Lord. You know, and she... In what she did, protecting the the spies, she was deceitful and she lied, you know, to cover up that she had hidden them. But she was a clever, crafty woman. She thought quickly and and Mm -hmm. she knew that God had blessed those men and was giving them the land and she hid them. And and then she covered it up and she was spared. And and as a result, she was listed in the genealogy of Jesus in, in Matthew 1 out of four women that were named. And I just find that interesting. She was... She wasn't anybody spectacular. Right. You know, she just was somebody that was somewhere at the right time Mm. and knew that the Lord was the true God and acted in the moment. And I just just find that comforting in some ways. Maybe she didn't go about it in the correct way. I don't really know, you know, but (laughs) it's just interesting to me how God uses ordinary people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the same with Ruth. I mean, Ruth wasn't doing anything particularly crazy. I mean, she was with her mother-in-law. I know that she tried to, you know, her mother-in-law was like, you need to go to back home. Um, she was like, no, you could have been really, you know, you're the family I know yeah. that I've been around. Exactly. Uh, we see that as like a huge decision, but, and then she's just working in a field, you know, she's just trying to live. She's not, yeah. <laughs> like you said, there's nothing magical yeah. about it. Now, I, God, I feel like it. my guess how I would feel had I been in Ruth's situation. That was a decision made out of fear. Mm -hmm. She chose to go with her mother-in-law because she knew her mother-in-law and she was safe and she had had been widowed. You know, she didn't want to start all over. That's scary. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Like you said, just an ordinary, an ordinary woman that God used that all of a sudden her name is showing up in the lineage of, Mm -hmm. of Christ, right. And King David, uh, which was a huge honor to, to have that, to see God use it. So, yeah, just ordinary, and that's I think what we forget a lot of times when we read, especially the Old Testament. We, I think we forget that these are people. This isn't just a story. These are people like you and I who had emotions, who had feelings, who had struggles, who went through things, um, who probably woke up in the morning and said, "Oh my gosh, I don't want to have to go to the well again." You know, right. I don't want to do that again. Are mm-hmm. you kidding me? It's hot, you know, or whatever. I mean, they just like us, same types of things. Um, And when we look at their life, if we were to actually look at every day of their life, most of them would be extremely boring people and boring Mm -hmm. stories. But Scripture does pull out just some of the ways that God extraordinarily used them, Mm -hmm. not because they were extraordinary people, but God did extraordinary things through them, right? Right. And that's that's the promises that we still have as 
people who are saved, right? With God uses the foolish of the world to shame the the wise. That's that's us as we live our story, our life uh, with our family, our kids, whatever it is, going to work. God can use that in miraculous ways uh, in other people's lives, but even in our lives to grow us closer to Him, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. these ladies of the Bible really uh, help us to to see that for sure. I, I think it's fascinating just the the priority that God's Word places on women. Because, as you mentioned, Kara, just the the cultural expectations or the norm, especially in the ancient world. Um, I mean, but you look at, like, the Apostle Paul in Romans 16, the longest greeting section he has in any of his letters, and many of them are women he he mentions in Rome. And he all, he also mentions, he always says Priscilla and Aquila, Priscilla being the, the, the woman, the wife, which would have, in the ancient world, would never have, you know, that would not have gone you know, gone over because you always put the man first. Right. And I think that think that's interesting. And Jesus, of course, too, he had, and you'll probably get to this, but he had women followers, you know, that followed him. Mm-hmm. And even, the, 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 I remember listening to a podcast, it was very interesting, the whole Mary and Martha story. I'd never had seen it this way. It was kind of, kind of like framed in a Jewish kind of context where it's like Martha wasn't just upset at Mary because she was distracted, if you will, sitting at the feet of Jesus, it was more to it. She was sitting at the feet of Jesus, which, which meant that she was taking on the posture of a, of a disciple, a Talmud in the Hebrew, which means she was sitting to receive. And Martha's looking at Mary like, what are you doing? <laughs> that was a huge, talk about countercultural um, situation. And I think Jesus saying she's chosen what's best is, is very radical but very significant to the kingdom of God and how God's kingdom is, is so, so vast and beautiful. Yeah. It really, when I listened to that in that context, I thought, Oh, that is really fat. Cause we, we tell, we, we hear the story. It's like, Oh yeah, Martha's cleaning the kitchen or cleaning the pots, whatever. Come on, Mary, come help me. But there was a bigger story going on. Right. The fact that she was taking this posture. So anyway, really interesting. No, that's helpful as we transition to the new Testament, because, um, one of the things I've also heard about rabbis is if you wanted to become a follower of a rabbi, you had to go to the rabbi and ask him. Yeah. The rabbi didn't go around and call people to become followers of him. So it was like you were trying to put on your best face mm-hmm. and bring everything you could and say, can I come and follow you and be your student? But Jesus does the opposite and he offers the call to discipleship to everyone regardless of what your standing is, regardless of who you are. I would also highly doubt that any rabbi would have called women oh, yeah. to be a disciple yeah. or even have allowed a woman to come up to him and say, can I be your disciple? But here's Jesus. And um, like we read in, in Luke chapter eight, we are told explicitly of a, of a group of women that followed Jesus along with the apostles, um, which is which I think is, is to your point, Dave, um, that Jesus' call to uh, discipleship is something that we need to really um, think more about mm-hmm. the the uh, how big of a contrast that would have been with the with the surrounding world because mm-hmm. um, we've we've got women I mean all throughout the New Testament I've got here Mary we think about Elizabeth women following Christ we have women who are healed by Jesus right the woman who um, uh, has uh, the the discharge issue going on we got the 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 woman the 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 uh, Canaanite woman who comes to Jesus and begs for her her daughter to be healed. We have a woman uh, forgiven by Jesus. The sinful woman. Remember, she comes and wipes Jesus's feet with her hair. Um, we've got the woman at the well. We got Mary anointing Jesus in John chapter twelve, um, doing all of those things. And uh, a couple of cave- couple of things I think are important. On the one hand, women were following Jesus as full fledged disciples, committed followers of Jesus. But on the other hand, they weren't apostles. So there is a distinction between um, the role of, of office, which is certain not all men are called to that office either. But there were 12 guys initially that were called to the office of apostle later on, the office of, of pastor. Um, and then, but, but everybody, men and women, were co-equal when it came to being called disciples of Jesus. And office is not... The office of pastor, the office of apostle, was never meant to be an office of lordship, 
but it was intended to be an office of shepherding and service for the whole congregation of men and women, the community, the spiritual family to take care of them. Um, so we, cause we live in a world today, right? Where that's an unpopular opinion to hold. Right. Um, the, the popular trend, even amongst people who would consider themselves evangelical at some level mm-hmm. is trending more and more towards, um, uh, an egalitarianism that would say um, women should be allowed to um, that the Bible allows women to take the teaching office of the church, which historically has not been the the opinion and the, the conviction of the church according to Scripture. But that being said, women are full fledged, committed, intelligent, um, active co-workers in the gospel and disciples of Jesus Christ doing many different things um, in the church. Um, so we see women, uh, again, one of the biggest things, right? The women are the first witnesses at the tomb. No religion would start with women being at the tomb in the ancient world, but they're the first ones. And they're actually the first ones who go and tell the apostles about what Jesus has done. We see women praying at Pentecost, women being persecuted by Paul, women mentioned in Acts coming to faith in Christ, women serving as a, uh, we talk about in Rome, in Romans chapter sixteen, right? We got women serving um, as you know teachers to other women. We have Priscilla also with Aquila teaching Apollos, um, taking him aside, instructing him in the way of the Lord. We've got Phoebe, who's called, who's a highly regarded servant of the Lord. Uh, women hosted the church; they were workers in the Lord, so on and so forth. There's just a, a wide variety of things and callings that women did within the community of faith. Um, yeah, I know I've been talking a lot, but any, any more, more comments about the New Testament church and the important role they were playing um, there as well? Um, something I was uh, reading through this summer um, when we were having a vacation Bible school was we were talking about Timothy one day, mm. and uh, the Bible mentions his mother and his grandmother instructing him in the ways of the <laughs> Lord. And there's no mention of a father figure there. Mm. And that's encouraging to me that these women were just going about their regular, ordinary lives, raising Timothy. And the Bible talks about how Timothy, from a young age, trusted and followed the Lord due to their teaching. You know, and Timothy became a very important figure in the New Testament, you know, and and affected lots of people Mm -hmm. because of his mother's and grandmother's influence in his early days. I just think that's really interesting. Yeah, I think that's wonderful, too, because they influenced him as mothers and grandmothers. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something like crazy or radical that they did. They were faithful Mm -hmm. where the Lord had already placed them. It wasn't something that had to be arranged or planned or, you know, some big event or something. It was just in their day to day life. That's what they Mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. There's a conference. Wow, this is really loud. There's a conference that I was recently at where the speaker at that moment there's probably about a thousand people that were in the room and they were talking about the issue of like women serving in ministry roles but talking about the role that women serve in their own families and the ministry that they have there and so they asked everyone to stand up who had come to faith before the age of like 15 and most everybody stood up in the room and then they told okay now sit down if your mother had no part to play in that and everybody was still standing up. And so it was just a really big demonstration to everybody in the room. Clearly, women have a ministry, right. you know, wow. uh, that is effective and is had a big, huge part to play in everybody's life that has come to Christ that has a mother in that way. Uh, but, yeah, in the same way, I mean, that's that's Timothy's story like you mm-hmm. were talking about. Mm-hmm. His mother and his grandmother leading him to faith. His dad is a Greek, but he has faithful mother and grandmother that is mm-hmm. teaching him the ways of the Lord. And that was just a really powerful, you know, illustration to see right there in front of you of the the important role that women play in all of our lives. That's something the feminist movement has had an impact on in our society now as a whole is <clears throat> the feminist movement started to say that the only way you can have worth as a woman is to get out into the workforce mm-hmm. and to create your own. To be a man. Yeah, to create. Well, just to create your own uh, story and what they've done in doing that is they have totally minimized children 
mm-hmm. in in the role of raising kids, right. the the role of marriage of a husband and a wife relationship. They've reduced that. That they've told women that actually doesn't mean anything for you. Having kids doesn't mean anything. Having a husband doesn't mean anything. You know, having a having a home. This doesn't mean anything. What the only thing that gives you value is how you can be a value to society is to go out and to work, right? I mean, that's really what what it has come. And, and sometimes they'll try to veil it and say, well, if you want to stay home, that's okay. But you can tell they don't mean that. That's no. not true. That's not what's meant. And so really, instead of lifting up women, what the feminist movement has done is it's demeaned women now to the point to where it's interesting because of the sexual revolution and all the gender stuff that's going on. The feminist movement is at a, is at a crossroads because they don't know what to do because they would have always sided with the sexual revolution. And, but now... Uh, men can be women and now it's degrading women even more. And there's like this big struggle and it really goes with what we uh, looked at in Psalm seven recently of digging a pit. And now it's crashing on your head. Your sin is crashing on your head. Um, But I think what the the feminist movement was saying, they were going to lift up women. All it's done is destroy is destroy them because now sadly there's women out there who don't see worth in raising children when really in the church, the biggest mission field is our children and the most important people oftentimes in that is the moms who are with them a lot. Now I'm not trying to minimize the role of dad because statistics do show right. that if dad's not involved, that's a problem. It does, it, it ends up being bad, but it's almost like telling all we, you know, we have this huge swath of missionaries in their homes with their little kids. And it's like, yeah, that's not that important. No, it's actually extremely important. That goes it's along critical. with what Scott was saying. It's critical. Like your role is, is critical. Raise these children in the Lord. Love them. Help them to learn what grace is and mercy is and and sin is and kindness, all this stuff, and pray over them. We want our kids to love our mothers, you know, we let because this is good for them, like you said, with with Timothy. Scott, like you said, in that room where they all stood. Well, my mom had an impact on that. You said like a thousand people are in there. And you're I'm guessing if you're at the conference, it's probably like a pastor type thingy so they might be leading churches i mean you're looking at tons of churches that are being led and what is the impact a mom who has no name to us Mm -hmm. but it does to them Mm -hmm. to that person right Right. um and so really the church lifts up women as we uh, read scripture and see what it says for us and men fall in that trap too right we start to think that we're defined by our job by our career we got to go make a name we want to get in the history books and that's a problem no we are husbands and we're fathers and we're uncles, and this is really what's most important. Let's raise these kids. Let's love them. Let's be a part of a church family. Let's help other parents raise their kids, right, be involved in their lives. Let's do that. No one's going to remember my name probably, but those few people might mm-hmm. and will, right. right? And that's then where the importance comes in, and that's normally how God God works. You know, Ruth, who would know Ruth? Nobody. But her name is in a lineage, mm-hmm. Which happens to be right. Jesus's. Right. <laughs> yeah, one, we were just talking about, you guys were, you mentioned Timothy and then the role of women. I think about, you know, Isaac had Sarah, Jacob had Rebecca, um, Samuel had Hannah, mm-hmm. Solomon had Bathsheba, and so on, to where you see the important roles of all of those men mm-hmm. raised by godly women. Um, and the roles that their mothers all had. I think, uh, and I want to talk about this in the next episode more, but... Then don't ruin it now. But the, just the idea, though... You're going to give just a little a taste. A little taste. So they taste. come back. But about the uh, the important role of the... Uh, the important complementarity, but also the collaboration that happens between men and women. You mm-hmm. see that working there, that men are not against women, and women are not against men. But we can see in that one, that's just one instance of one type of relationship, the mother's, the mother-son relationship, how the, the sexes work together in God's design to further God's kingdom. Um, Solomon would not have been the man he was without Bathsheba, right? right. Um, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And I just think that's an important thing to, uh, to remember. One of the funniest stories for me in the Bible is uh, Jesus with his mom at the wedding. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. remember, she's like, hey, you need to do something. And remember his response like, now's not my time. But what happens? He goes and does it. He goes and does it. He goes and does it. I mean, and it, show, it shows the impact his mother had on his life. I mean, he honored her and respected her even to his death. Right. Yeah. You take care of my mom. 
Right. She says. took care of him. Yes. And he took care of her. Yeah. And you just see this special relationship there where we're talking about Jesus, the son of God. But yet he had a mother who was highlighted. And we don't even hear about Joseph <laughs> anymore. Right? right. For I mean, we hear about him early on, but then we don't get much. But Mary is still there. Mm-hmm. And he talks about his mother and he cares for his mother. And there seems to be uh, a relationship where he listens to her. Like you're talking about these guys listening to their mom. Mm-hmm. We have the son of God listening to his mom. Yeah. Are, right, um, and God using her uh, in that in that way, which is, I just always like that story. Now's not my time. Fine, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> so here's here's a question I would like to ask. We've talked about particularly the role that women played in the early in the history of the Bible, particularly as mothers, and you can also see that relationship as wives. But let me ask you this: What if there's a a, a woman who's a single woman, but a Christian and in the church? What what is her role? What What is, um, I don't want to just simply focus on being a wife and a mother. That is sure. going That is going to be the predominant pathway for most women, just like most men will become fathers and husbands. But what right now, if you're single and you're a woman in the local church, what is your, what is the important role that you have, uh, Kara? What, I mean, I, oh, I, I, I feel like that is such a gift. Like, um, your responsibilities are different. You know, as a mother, my responsibilities are to my husband and to my children. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times that makes, de- that just right there makes the decision and what I can and cannot do. Mm. And if I didn't have that, I would have so many other opportunities of ways that I could serve the Lord and minister to others. And sometimes I, I wish for that, but that's, you know, that's not what God has called me to. Um, I feel like they can they can have a vast impact if they're intentional about their time and choices mm-hmm. and in their ministry to others. Yeah. I think Paul, Paul directs in first Corinthians seven, he says, marriage is a great thing. And elsewhere he'll encourage, particularly he talks about single women getting married, mm-hmm. say, let them get married. But if you do have the gift of singleness, he says, it's a really good thing. Yes. If you can, um, in First Corinthians seven, it, for men or women, it's a it's a value right. for the gospel I if would, you can. Excuse me. I would like to encourage women that are in that position to look at that as a, a special gift. Like there aren't very many that have that. Yeah. So take advantage of what the Lord has given you in in ways that you can serve that other people cannot mm-hmm. do what you can do. Yeah, I think that's important. We, I've, I've heard single people say, well, your church is focused on families, and so I don't feel like I have a place. And what they're missing there is our, our church is actually about our family, the family of God, this church, and you are a part of this family, mm-hmm. right? So you might not have birthed a child, but my child is a part of your family. Yes. And whether you like it or not, you are their aunt. You know, you are yes. their sister in Christ. Um, and so... I need you right. to help me. And that's what you get to do. So I think sometimes single people uh, rob the Lord of the gift that he's given them, and they take advantage of their singleness to go live their life in singleness. Right? right. And what the gift actually is for is to be able to then turn around and serve the church. And so you can love on families because right. you're a part of our family. Now, Sadly, what might happen, though, in church is other church members don't treat you like family, Mm -hmm. and that's a problem. But that is what it is. You need to remember that you are a part of the family, and as Kara was saying, you have opportunities to do things that others don't. You know, uh, People are at home with young kids, would love to go probably and and serve the church in this way. They just can't at that time. It's not they don't love their church. They just can't. Right. Maybe you can. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it's <laughs> it's funny how often t- it's the, that saying of how the grass seems greener on the other side, mm-hmm. you know, of if you're single and you want nothing more than to be in a relationship, married, have children, but you are you have all of these opportunities available to those who are married and do have children. And when you are married and do have children, you think, man, I would love to be able to take take that opportunity to serve in that way, but I just can't. I don't have the ability to do that. And so it's, um, y- you see that whenever you mm-hmm. are in that position. Yeah, and it's the know. job of us, I think, who are married, who have kids, to, to treat single women, single men in our church as family. 
Mm-hmm. So to invite them over, to care for them, to talk to them, you know, to treat them like family, to check in on them, uh, because it becomes easy to ostracize, I think, at times. And I don't think we do it on Un- purpose yeah. all the Unintentionally, time. Unintentionally. Unintentionally, yes. just with busyness and different things of life. Um, but yeah, the, to the single lady, you're, you are a part of this uh, family. And you're a vital, you know, you're a mm-hmm. vital part of this family. Don't don't rob the Lord of the gift He's given you of singleness right now, which maybe is only for a time. Maybe that singleness will end. You know, for at, most at, people, it will end. Yeah, yeah, at some point. Um, but don't, you know, don't uh, misuse the time that you have in mm-hmm. your singleness right now. Uh, serve the Lord in it and be useful right. in it. Yeah. One last group that I think is they're they are single now. But that is especially highlighted, uh, particularly mm-hmm. in First Timothy five, is widows. Mm-hmm. So, um, what role can women, widows, who are who are widows in our congregation? Um, they have an important role in in First Timothy five, right? They're taken care of. Um, um, they're they're godly, um, but they have an important place too in the the spiritual family that is the church. Right. Could you talk a little bit about that too, sure. Kara? Sure, I actually have a couple of those women in my life. Um, Years ago, um, there was a lady in the church that we attended, an elderly lady that was a widow, and she would write me letters, and she would decorate the envelopes, and they were just like sunshine in my mailbox. Mm. You know, they were always encouraging, and she was telling me that she was praying for me, and she had a really a really big ministry to me and to my daughter as well. My daughter has a whole box of letters that she got from her, and just recently, I have a friend that's a widow and um, helped me do a class for little girls, mm. and she said, I, I would love to do this. I have lots of free time. I'm able to do this. And she'd just been looking for Mm. ways. She's fairly recently widowed. Mm. So she said, I'm looking for ways that I can be used, you know, now that her life is completely different than what it was before. And she had a vital impact on the little girls that were there and they just love her. They've developed Mm. a relationship now where she can speak into their lives. Mm. And I, I'd been, it's been wonderful to see. Yeah, I think how a widow will function in the life of the church will deter, you know, be determined some by their age and their health and stuff, right? There's mm-hmm. some widows who would love to be at church mm-hmm. and to serve the church, but they're older and they just they just can't, right? They're just not there. And so then it's our job as the church to care for them, right? right? And to be able to minister to them. And um, I don't know if all of our ladies in the church realize it, but that's, a, that's something that we as pastors desperately need because... It is it is awkward sometimes to have a one on one a man and a woman no matter what the age is mm-hmm. until you build a comfort level where maybe it's a little more comfortable, but to know like that there are women in our church who are consistently checking on widows or women in the church mm-hmm. and ministering to them to know that that's not being left undone, right? Um, because it doesn't have to be a pastor that does that stuff; it can be a, a church member. So we have right. faithful ladies in our church right now who some are widowed, some aren't, but they're checking on people who are widowed, or some of our older women in our church, and and loving on them and caring for them, and they're doing exactly what they should be doing. I think, right. and I, I'm thankful that those women, you know, aren't aren't quitting. Because sadly, a lot of people get to like retirement age and they retire from work, but also church. Right. And they might attend church, but they're retired from the work of church, and they're like, that's for other people now and it's like no we no no, we we need you guys to keep to keep going and to keep helping um and again thankfully that's that is happening so i do think the age matters for the widow Mm -hmm. because like you said with your friend who's still you know younger and able to go and active and wants to wants to be doing stuff yeah she's in a new place in life but to it's also good for her to minister because it shows her that god still has you know worth in her and plans right. in her right? right and so she feels uh productive and useful which is a good thing right. to feel right? right and so uh it's good that she gets to mm-hmm. minister in those right. ways i think also the the more that we think of church as being family um a number of these concerns that we have about you know today one of the big concerns right is is um what can women do in the local church that's a hot topic mm-hmm. But I think if we would really just let the idea that church is, we are a family, that would really take care of a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think another thing too is, Tim, you, you brought up a, th- a helpful thing when you were saying um, retiring from your job and retiring from church. 
Well, they never think I'm retiring from my physical family. Right. So church is not primarily a place that you work. It's a place that you are. Right. It's a place that you belong to by the blood of Christ. And so um, just like a, an earthly family has mothers or grandmothers or aunts and uncles, brothers, sisters, that's exactly the way we're supposed to function as a spiritual family. I mean, that's what Paul says to Timothy in chapter five, verse one, do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father to the younger men as brothers, the older women as mothers and the younger women as sisters. So treat them as the family that you are. And I think that's a helpful thing for widows of any age, of single women of any age, um, the children, uh, every, every, every aspect of that is if we would treat each other with the realization that we are family, um, because that would reorient, I think, as well, the idea that we have of ministry, where we think about, I punch the clock at work, and then I punch the clock at church. Well, actually, do you ever think of yourself as punching the clock for your local family? You yeah, would, I, I do. Uh, Tim, no. <laughs> Tim, do, Tim does. You have 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah. go. <laughs> so I just think that that's an important thing to realize that, you know, I will always, even though, for instance, I don't see my grandparents, the two that are living still, um, I don't think about myself as not their grandson because I don't live there and I don't see them very often. Right. Regardless of how long it is between I see them, I am their grandson. And uh, But whenever I go there, it's not like I go there and think I'm punching the clock. It's just this is what is. And I think that's so important for us in the church to realize this is what is. This is truth. This is reality. Um, and you're my brother and sister. And You're my brother. You're my sister. Um, in the Lord, isn't that a song? You're my brother, you're my sister. You know that. You know that old song. Come yeah, come and take me by the hand. You guys, mm-hmm. I don't know, but you're dancing. In okay, you. that was that may have been from my CCM days. Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, well, quick, real quick before we wrap up this episode, Kara, do you want to talk about the conference coming up for women on September 22nd through 23rd? Yes, we're having a women's conference here at the church, like Spencer said. September 22nd, Friday evening, and Saturday morning, um, well, through lunchtime on the 23rd. Uh, Gretchen Ronovic is our speaker, and w- the theme of the conference is Ragged, Spiritual Disciplines for the Spiritually Exhausted. Um, that's the name of Gretchen's book, and I think it will be a very valuable conference for anyone who feels overwhelmed in their day-to-day life. Um, feels like maybe they're not doing it right or not doing it well enough. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. I think Gretchen's going to have a lot of very valuable things to say to us. Uh, Please come. Please bring um, your friends and your family. Uh, Girls that are going into sixth grade on up are welcome to come. Um, Registration, the early bird registration is still open until Tuesday, I believe. What's that date? The twenty okay. second. Twenty second. Okay. August. So, so this so will come will, out. Before this will come out Thursday. That. So too late. Too late. Too late. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So, so you can still register though. Yeah, you, you can, can still, still register. register. We appreciate the extra donation. <laughs> Thirty five dollars, and that covers the the three sessions we have for the conference and mm. your lunch and a yeah. book and a goodie bag. Is that her stuff. only book? Do you know? Does Cur- she have more? Currently. Okay. That's her only book. I, I'm pretty sure she's writing another right now. Oh, all right. And she has a podcast out she there, does. I think. She has a podcast, and that is titled Freely Given. Mm-hmm. And um, Yeah, if people wanted yes, to hear her yes, before. Yes, if you wanted to, to listen to her podcast, Freely Given. She has a lot of really interesting topics mm-hmm. that you could listen to ahead of time. Yeah, it'll be good. Yeah. Spencer and I will be there serving, so that make it better. Yes, the men yeah. are going to be helping us serve lunch and take care of details in the background, whatever we need. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a great time. It is. It's going to be a really good time. <laughs> I'm excited about it. So, um, yeah, so they can go to the website, or how can they register yes, if they want to? There, you could go to the event page on the church website, or you could just call the church office, and we can get your information and get you registered. Outstanding. Whatever's easiest for you. And let me ask you this, Kara. Mm-hmm. If I'm a woman, or I know somebody who would love to come but can't afford it, what do I do? 
we do have some sponsorships available. We do not want financial hardship mm-hmm. to be a problem for anybody mm-hmm. to come. We want people to come and hear this. So please don't say to yourself, I can't go because I can't afford the $35. We absolutely will work with you. And we'll just increase the fees for everybody else. (laughs) Um, We have their bank account numbers. No problem on our end. Um, It's very easy. I was going to say, if there's anyone from Missouri who wants to drive in, Spencer's opened his house to stay, right? um, Anyone from Missouri. My house is rather small. Um well, you could find you could find something for them. Yeah, I have a couch in the garage, so <laughs> if you want to come, um, you're welcome. Welcome to do that. So um, you're willing to go out to the couch? Yeah, and they can have your bed. Is that what you're I saying? I could do that too. Me and Winston will just sit there and sleep all night. And uh, we got some lovely. Night. I have some box fans and an overhead fan. I could I could run. Um, if, that's if just for Missouri be. people. Just for Missouri people from the Show Me State. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Special okay. Offer. All right. Well, thank you for listening. Uh, Thank you, Kara. Um, She'll be with us the next episode as well. And uh, join us as we talk about the importance of women's ministry here at MNBC and uh, how Kara is leading the women here to serve and to to grow women in the, the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Take care and God bless.